Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry we are a little tardy today. We'll try to avoid that as best as we can. Um, I have a couple things off the top uh, before I dive into your questions. Uh, so first, uh, yesterday, the US Consulate General in Hyderabad opened a new state-of-the-art facility in the city's bustling financial district. Uh, the move brings our government closer uh, to U.S. companies that have invested billions of dollars in India's tech, defense, aerospace, and pharmaceutical sectors, five of the highest values companies in the world. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Meta host their largest presence outside of the United States in Hyderabad. Our consulate in Hyderabad is a key to linking businesses and people from the United States and the Indian states of Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha. We continue to welcome Indian visitors, business people, and students from those states, and this new facility puts us in a position to increase Mission India's consular services in the future. Uh, the new facility, with a project budget of $340 million, pays respect to the local landscape, and through the Ambassador's Fund for C Cultural Preservations, we are working with local partners to preserve historic monuments. The new space will help consulate staff work with local journalists, it will increase reporting on climate change, and share information on educational opportunities. The new consulate in Hyderabad will also host countless visitors as our militaries regularly team up for joint exercises based out of India's Eastern Naval Command. Put simply, this dynamic region plays a critical role in the U.S.-India strategic partnership, and our new consulate chancery in Hyderabad represents a tangible investment by the United States in the growing uh, bilateral relationship. I also wanted to offer an update on uh, the, some of the earthquake efforts uh, on behalf of Turkey and northern Syria. Uh, we support and applaud our international partners who raised $7.5 billion in earthquake assistance pledges for Turkey and Syria at yesterday's EU-hosted International Donors Conference in Brussels. During this conference, the United States uh, announced we are providing an additional $50 million in urgent humanitarian assistance to help earthquake-affected communities in Turkey and Syria. This brings total U.S. humanitarian assistance to support the earthquake response to $235 million. With this additional humanitarian assistance, U.S. partners are expanding existing deliveries of food relief items, shelter, safe water, sanitation, clothes items, and other things to reach millions impacted in Turkey and Syria. We are grateful for the successful efforts of the organizers of this meeting, which was co-hosted by the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and by the Prime Minister of Sweden, Ulf Kristofsson, for the Swedish Presidency of the European Council. As Secretary Blinken said, uh, the U.S. will remain committed to providing necessary assistance to those impacted by these earthquakes. The U.S. will continue to support those impacted in Turkey and Syria, and we welcome and encourage continued support from our international partners in this time of great need. And lastly, uh, the United States is extremely troubled that the Israeli Knesset has passed legislation rescinding important parts of the 2005 disengagement law including the prohibition on establishing settlements in the Northern West Bank. At least one of these outposts in this area, Homesh, was built on private Palestinian land, which is illegal under Israeli law. It is all the more concerning that such a significant piece of legislation passed with just 31 yes votes out of an assembly of 120 members. De-escalating and reducing violence are in all parties' interests, including Israel's. The U.S. strongly urges Israel to refrain from allowing the return of settlers to the area covered by the legislation, consistent with both former Prime Minister Sharon and the current Israeli government's commitment to the United States. We have been clear that advancing settlements is an obstacle to peace and the achievement of a two-state solution. This certainly includes creating new settlements, building or legalizing outposts, or allowing building of any kind on private Palestinian land or deep in the West Bank adjacent to Palestinian communities, all of which would be facilitated by this legal change. The action also represents a clear contradiction of undertakings the Israeli government made to the United States. Nearly 20 years ago, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, on behalf of Israel, affirmed in writing to George W. Bush that it, would that it committed to evacuate these settlements and outposts 
in the Northern West Bank in order to stabilize the situation and reduce frictions. The amendments to the disengagement law are also inconsistent with Israel's recent commitments to de-escalating Israeli-Palestinian tensions. Just two days ago, Israel reaffirmed its commitment to stop discussion of any new settlements for four months and to stop authorization of any outposts for six months. Coming at a time of heightened tensions, the legislative changes announced today are particularly provocative and counterproductive to efforts to restore some measures of calm as we head into Ramadan, Passover, and the Easter holidays. With that, Matt, happy to Okay, well, that was quite a mouthful, wasn't I know. I'm, sometimes we have, we have things to share. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, get, I, I do want to, before I get back to that, let me just ask one real quick question sure. about what's your understanding of the status of uh, detained American citizens in Saudi Arabia? And then I'll go right to Israel. Sure. Uh, so, Matt, um, <coughs> Uh, the welfare and safety of U.S. citizens overseas is, the, as you know, the highest priority uh, of the Department of State. Uh, we are aware of reports that a U.S. citizen was released from prison in Saudi Arabia. And of course, uh, we welcome this news, uh, but there's a limit to uh, any further detail that I'm able to get into given privacy considerations. So you can't, uh, you can't say at all whether it is correct that Mr. El Mahdi, whose son has talked publicly about his father being released what I, what I would say is that we're aware of these reports and uh, we we welcome this news but uh, I'm not able to, to get into any further details okay um, then on your opening statement about Israel um, and the Knesset uh, law I, I'm just wondering uh, you know those are strong words but uh, are you gonna do anything um, in response Matt, this is or some is it just something that you're gonna criticize verbally Matt, this is, uh, these are topics and issues that we raise directly uh, with our Israeli counterparts. Uh, as I uh, outlined in my topper, we did so uh, as recently uh, as over the course of the past two days uh, at the Aqaba meetings, as well as the meetings taking place uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh. Uh, this is something we have raised consistently through channels in this building, through Ambassador Tom Nides. Uh, it's the, something that President Biden uh, had the opportunity to uh, discuss with um, Prime Minister Netanyahu. It's something the Secretary has raised uh, as well, and this is something that we're going to continue to remain deeply engaged uh, and vocal about. Uh, okay, so the short answer is no, you're not going to actually do anything well, other than make statements like critical statements from the podium. Is that, Matt, is that, is that a fair? assessment of? The, uh, like I said this is something that we're going to uh, we continue to raise directly uh, with our Israeli counterparts and remain engaged on and it's why quite frankly uh, as an administration we continue to remain deeply committed to uh, a, a, a negotiated two-state solution right but you're not actually going to do anything about it other than say that you don't like it. Matt, we continue correct? to have a, a number of tools at our disposal to uh, engage with uh, with our partners uh, and to uh, uh, make our viewpoint uh, quite clear. So other than other than this one, you speaking from the podium right now, could, can you give a, us one or two examples of what those tools are? Matt, this is something that we raise directly. It's something our allies and partners in the region also uh, raise uh, directly with, with Israel and, uh, and other countries as well. So just, uh, on the same topic. Same topic, yeah, just, same. Um, just one, sec one thing to clarify. You said uh, this was raised at the, in the Aqaba meeting, um, but also like recently, I mean, what was the highest level of engagement from State Department to Israelis? Uh, again, this is uh, something that we raise regularly, the desire to uh, uh, take steps to uh, calm tensions, uh, especially as it relates to uh, the growth and expansion of settlements and outposts. Uh, you've seen our ambassador, Tom Nides, uh, speak uh, openly about his engagements on this subject with our uh, Israeli partners. Uh, we've done so through uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Leaf and others. The secretary had the opportunity to discuss this uh, when he was um, in uh, in in Jerusalem, and by this I mean specifically the just the 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 the, the growth of out, 
of posts and settlements. Not I'm not talking about this legislation specifically. Right, but right. does the secretary now have any plans or any other high any any other plans for any other high level in, engagement on this specifically? On I, I, I don't have any calls to to preview or, or to get ahead of. But again, this is something that we uh, remain deeply uh, engaged and in, uh, in in close contact on. Uh, I'm going to go to Said and then I can come back to you, Leon. Since I just had want you know I'll try again what Matt just asked you. So. Aside from a really strong words, and they were, you know, what can you do? I mean, how can you leverage your statement? How can the United States of America leverage its anger at this decision by the Israeli Knesset? Said, uh, uh, first, what I would say broadly is that uh, the comments uh, from the United States, they're not um, uh, going into some sort of uh, abyss or vacuum. Uh, uh, the, the, when the United States speaks about something, um, countries around the world are listening. Uh, and when the United States is engaged on something and committed to something, uh, I, I, I believe that the, the, the rest of the world is, is, is paying attention. And as I have said, this is something uh, specifically uh, we have been very clear about, that uh, the growth of settlements uh, and outposts uh, is inconsistent with our views on what steps are necessary uh, uh, to get us to a, a negotiated uh, two-state solution in a peaceful way. Um, I was just quite clear about that. So, uh, you know, countries around the world may be listening. Is Israel listening? Is the government of Israel listening? Uh, Said, we uh, engage with the government of Israel uh, quite regularly uh, in, on, on a number of issues, including these ones. With that, I mean, only yesterday, Smotrich said there is no such thing as the Palestinians. I mean, he just, and he said he wants this heard in the White House. He made sure to underscore the White House. He's telling you. And we're well, not listening to you. What, what we're not would, taking anything that you might say into account. That's what he's saying. What I would say to that, uh, uh, Finance Minister Smotrich is not the uh, only uh, individual in, in the Israeli government. But what I would say uh, to his comments broadly, Said, since you've given me opportunity, is the latest comments by Mr. Smotrich, which were uh, delivered um, at a podium adorned with uh, an inaccurate and provocative map, uh, are offensive, uh, they are uh, deeply concerning, and candidly, they're dangerous. Uh, the Palestinians have a rich history and culture, and the United States greatly values uh, our partnership with the Palestinian people. And as President Biden said uh, last summer in Bethlehem, the U.S. remains committed to two states for two people, both of whom have deep ancient roots in the land, living side by side in peace and security. We also affirm that two states uh, along the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps remain the best way to achieve equal measures of security, prosperity, and freedom, and democracy for Palestinians and Israelis alike. We underscore the importance of the U.S. strategic relationship with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the second Arab state to take the courageous step of making peace with Israel. And we welcome Israel's reaffirmation of the 1994 peace treaty uh, with Jordan. Well, you know, just if I may follow up, I mean, this person, this uh, Israeli minister, was here only 10 days ago. Are you, is, there, is this administration willing to declare him a persona non grata for you? Said, what measures I, can you take against such a statement? Said, I'm Said, sure I'm not if, here. Somebody, if somebody denied the existence of another people elsewhere, you would take a very strong statement against such individual. Said, I, we're taking a strong statement now. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals about what we would do if a, uh, another uh, uh, government official in another uh, uh, country did something hypothetical. What I am here to tell you, as I just said a, a moment ago, is that we found those comments to, to not only be uh, uh, inaccurate, but also uh, deeply concerning uh, yeah. and, and dangerous. Except so. he but did not care. Action, he, said, he said that, you know, I want this heard in the White House. He said that exactly. I mean, you have no response to him. You can't say this person is is, is not welcome in the United States. Uh, I again, I don't have any uh, uh, designation or characterizations that you should offer. Said, uh, what I will just leave it at is that those comments were concerning. They were dangerous uh, and they were offensive. But the Knesset vote is not a hypothetical. It's happened. They clearly were acting at the behest of the government of the prime minister, of the finance minister. How can they be held accountable? Where, to repeat what Matt and Said have been asking, where is the leverage? What is the discussion in this building about how to hold Israel accountable 
keeping in mind that the U.S. has a vested interest in protecting it from a security standpoint, but how can this government allow Israel to undermine the goal of a two-state solution when things such as this have now happened? Well, first, you you are absolutely right. Our our commitment to uh, Israel's security and Israel's security concerns are ironclad. Uh, but I will also note that uh, we have, uh, when need we need to, very frank uh, and honest conversations with our Israeli partners. Uh, and there's no uh, hypothetical about it. You're right. This kind of legislation does undermine um, uh, what we think uh, could be required for a negotiated two-state solution. We have been clear that advancing settlements is an obstacle to peace and uh, an obstacle to achieving a two-state solution. Uh, and and that certainly uh, the, what this legislation would do would be create new settlements or buildings and legalize outposts. Uh, all of this uh, would further incite tensions and put a uh, negotiated two-state solution um, uh, further away. I'm not going to uh, uh, stand up here and offer um, a litany list of all the ways in which we can and hold um, uh, our, our Israeli partners accountable, but beyond to say that we uh, raise these issues directly, we raise these issues regularly. Uh, we do it through this building, we do it through the president, we do it through Secretary Blinken, we do it through our ambassador. Um, all of those ways are opportunities for us to engage on this issue, which is very, very important to us. But, but the point is, yeah, even granted that the president had a discussion with the Prime Minister this past weekend. Given that 10 days ago the Finance Minister was in this country and no one from the U.S. government made a point of meeting with him, not to mention all of the affinity groups that pointedly did not meet with Mr. Smotrich, it looks like it's all talk. What are the things that are being looked at? Could there be travel restrictions on those members of the Knesset who voted for this legislation? Could there be a restriction on funding provided to the Israeli government that does not affect the security portfolio? Could there be anything done? Could, you know, does this mean that it makes it more likely that the Palestinian uh, consulate is reopened in Jerusalem? What are the things that this government is prepared to do in order to send the message? Because clearly, all of the talk has not given what the U.S. would like to see change in the situation. There are a, a, a number of options uh, that we continue to look at in which we uh, can and do engage with our Israeli partners. I'm not going to uh, get into previewing them, but what I will just say again and reiterate is that this is an issue that uh, is of utmost concern to us and something that we uh, have uh, quite directly and uh, candidly uh, will continue to raise with our Israeli partners. I mean, I'm not suggesting that the administration might want to consider the James Baker solution of 91, but, but you have to get the government's attention if you're serious about trying to reach a solution that goes back to 67 with the great territory. We, we are serious about a solution and we have this administration has taken a, a number of uh, actions and the comments that we've offered uh, have indicated how serious we are. And when, um, uh, either side has taken steps that we think put us further away, whether that be uh, uh, the Israelis or the Palestinians. We have been quite vocal uh, about how those uh, steps are unhelpful uh, to getting us to what the United States views as our as our as a goal, uh, as I just was at the beginning of this briefing, we have not parsed words when we have felt that certain actions uh, take us away towards what we believe is uh, the best solution uh, for the Israeli and Palestinian people, as well as the best solution that will offer uh, a long-term stability, uh, security, and peace uh, for the region as well. Leon, and then I'll get to the yeah, back of the conversation. Yeah, we can ask Israel, but. My question has been answered, uh, so I'm going to move on to another region. Uh, Anything so else on, on the region before we move on? On on Israel or, 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 or no? Okay, I will come back to you, Janny. Go ahead. And okay. on. I was wondering, uh, Vedant, if you had any information, detail, insight you could give us to the Secretary's role in, in the liberation of, uh, well, two hostages, one French, one American. In, in Nigeria, which was released yesterday. Uh, since, of course, the secretary was 
in the region, in Nigeria, just thanks. last week. Yeah, thanks, Leon. So uh, the U.S. is pleased to confirm the release of uh, U.S. citizen Jeffrey Woodkey, who uh, had been held hostage in West Africa for more than six years. Uh, this release is thanks to the extraordinary cooperation of the government of Niger and the sustained efforts of countless organizations and individuals around the world. Uh, we want the American people to know that the U.S. government has no higher priority than their safety and security, uh, and the Biden administration will continue to work aggressively using a wide range of tools until all U.S. citizens uh, being held hostage or wrongfully detained are brought home. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of sensitive diplomatic conversations, Leon, but uh, at, at this uh, point in this administration, it should be no surprise to you that uh, in any country where U.S. nationals are being held hostage or wrongfully detained, uh, we, uh, the State Department, raise those cases uh, at every opportunity. And as I said, this uh, release is thanks to the extraordinary cooperation uh, of the government of Niger. And you all had the opportunity to hear from Secretary Blinken yesterday from this very podium. Uh, and uh, later in the day, we were able to share that he was able to uh, speak to Mr. Family, Mr. Woodkey's family uh, and share in their excitement uh, for his return. Uh, and he also reiterated that the United States will continue to provide all appropriate uh, assistance. Um, Jenny, go ahead. Thank you. I have uh, two questions in China and North Korea. Sure. First, first question in uh, North Korea issues. The United Nations Security Council's condemn, condemnation statement and uh, adoption of sanctions against North Korea's ballistic missile launch violations failed due to China and uh, Russia's uh, use of their veto power. How does the U.S. respond to poor role of the U.N. Security Council? So first, Jenny, let me say that the United States condemns the DPRK's March 19th ballistic missile launch, which came just three days after the DPRK's uh, most recent ICBM launch. Uh, this launch is in violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions and is the latest in a series of launches that pose a threat to the DPRK's neighbors and undermine regional security. Uh, and it's particularly concerning that the DPRK categorized, uh, characterized this launch uh, as the simulated use of a tactical uh, nuclear uh, weapon. Uh, as it relates to uh, the UN Security Council, we uh, continue to believe that um, all members of the Security Council have a role to play in holding the DPRK accountable, uh, especially those uh, that have influence uh, over uh, Pyongyang, um, and uh, particularly uh, that now is not the time to be using uh, uh, vetoes uh, to, to cover, up, uh, cover up for the DPRK. On uh, China, uh, sure. China is uh, secretly supplying weapons to Russia and ignoring North Korea's uh, series of uh, missile provocations. Do you see any objection to China's role as a peace uh, mediator? Let me say a couple of things uh, to that, uh, Jenny. Uh, first, uh, the, the, we encourage uh, President Xi to uh, advocate for the point that they outlined in their own 12-point uh, plan, uh, which is uh, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. Uh, we encourage President Xi to advocate for this point, which must include uh, withdrawal of Russian forces from sovereign Ukrainian territory consistent with the U UN Charter. Uh, I think it's quite clear that the entire world would like to see this war end, especially the Ukrainians themselves, who have put forward their own plan for a just peace, which draws on these very UN principles that I just spoke about. And, and let's remember, this war could end today if Russia uh, withdrew its troops from Ukraine. Camilla? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Secretary Blinken is set to take time tomorrow. Uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Mike McCall has put out, made public another letter that he sent to the Secretary asking for the same documentation that he's already previously asked for um, related to the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. I know that Ned last week said that the State Department is working to comply with providing that documentation in time for the House Committee's deadline of March 23rd or by close of business tomorrow. Uh, can you give us an update on whether the State Department will meet um, the expectations of the House Committee, uh, whether documentation will be provided, and if so, in what form? 
Uh, I will uh, echo what Ned said that we uh, are and we intend to comply. The State Department is committed to working with all congressional committees with jurisdiction to appropriately accommodate their need for information and to help them conduct uh, uh, oversight for legislative purposes. Uh, the department has provided more than 200 briefings to bipartisan members and staff on Afghanistan policy since the withdrawal of U.S. Afghanistan, U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Uh, additionally, senior department representatives have appeared in public hearings and answered questions on Afghanistan policy, and the department has responded to numerous requests for information from members and their staffs related to uh, Afghanistan policy. Uh, as Chairman McCall also has previously said, he and the Secretary have had a constructive discussion when the Chairman visited the Department earlier this year, and the Secretary reaffirmed his commitment to cooperate with the Committee's work, and we have since provided hundreds of pages of documents responsive to the chairman's request regarding Afghanistan, and we will uh, continue to, to do so. We are working as expeditiously as possible to accommodate what was an extensive and detailed request, and our provision of information and documents to the committee will continue as we collect and process uh, additional uh, responsive records. Alex. Oh, uh, look, Kylie had a follow-up, then I'll come back to you, Alex. Sure. Go ahead, Kylie. Um, just to be a little bit more specific, they've obviously requested a tremendous number of documents from this building, but there's three um, sets of documents or documents that they um, have said they prioritize or would like you to prioritize giving to them. Um, one is the dissent cable that was written from um, diplomats last July. Uh, the second is the department's Afghanistan withdrawal after action report. And the third is multiple versions of the department's um, emergency action plans for Kabul. Um, on those three specific things, can you give us an update as to um, if you think that those documents will be provided to the committee by the end of the day tomorrow? Uh, I'm just not going to get into a uh, tit-for-tat litany of, 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 of the work that's being ongoing. What I will just reiterate is that we have since provided hundreds of pages of documents responsive to the chairman's request. We're going to continue to do so. We're working as expeditiously as we can. Uh, as you know, this uh, whole process requires uh, very intensive and detailed work, um, uh, processing and looking at records and uh, 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 figuring out what uh, uh, is uh, responsive to the various requests. So I'm going to let that process continue to play and, out. And just, I assume then that the department is prepared to have to deal with subpoenas if those documents aren't provided. Uh, we, at, 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 at any turn, uh, this department is always uh, going to intend to comply with the law. Alex, go ahead. A couple of questions, but let me just follow up with China first. Sure. Um, let me get your sense on uh, um, today's second days of meeting between uh, President Xi and uh, Putin. Um, other than just lavish display of solidarity and friendship we have seen, what do you think uh, Chinese president is really after in, in Russia? Alex, that's a question for President Xi. I'm not going to uh, uh, speculate uh, there. You uh, should reach out to his spokesperson. Sure. You probably have seen, uh, probably have seen uh, Russian uh, uh, officials uh, today say that they are planning to put together UN Security Council uh, meeting, informal meeting on uh, quote unquote uh, the truth about Ukrainian uh, children uh, being transferred to Russia. Um, let me give you a reaction to that and also to the fact that a man who is wanted by the ICC for war crimes is going to actually lead the world's most important security body as of next week. Uh, Alex, uh, we know the truth about what's happening to Ukrainian children. Uh, our colleagues at Yale University and the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations uh, have uh, shown immense leadership in um, unearthing the horrific truths of what is happening to uh, Ukrainian children. We are seeing uh, numerous reports, have seen numerous reports of children um, being separated from their families, um, being uh, sent to uh, uh, facilities uh, all across Russia, some uh, that are closer to the United States when it comes to mileage as opposed to Ukraine. Uh, Russian Ukrainian children um, being uh, forced to be adopted by Russian families. Uh, we know what's happening to Ukrainian children. We don't need uh, the Russian Federation to tell us. And the second Nike. part of my question oh, was sorry. about put, the, the fact that Putin is going to lead uh, that the world's most important body. Do you have any problems? He's going to lead what? UN Security Council as of next week. 
I think what I would say, Alex, again, is that we have been quite consistent in any multilateral setting, whether it be the G20 or even now the uh, the UN Security Council, that as it relates to Russia, uh, it cannot be business as usual. And quite candidly, Alex, we know that uh, the countries that make up the UN membership agree. Uh, as recently as just a number of weeks ago, you saw more than 140 countries speak in unison about how the Russian Federation needed to respect territorial integrity, respect sovereignty, and withdraw its forces uh, from Ukraine. Hey, Nike, I'm going to work China. the room a little, I, Alex. Nike, go ahead. Just follow up on the uh, China-Russia joint statement. Could you uh, provide a general assessment, US assessment? Do you see anything new there? And um, I know you do not comment on intelligence matters, but would you have anything to share on if the uh, US has any indication that Russia uh, President Putin has asked Xi Jinping to provide lethal weapons during the, the, the visit. Thank you. Uh, I, like I said, like you so uh, aptly pointed out, I'm not going to, um, uh, that's a better question for them. I don't have any information to, to offer on that. But broadly, and this is something that the Secretary has spoken about quite consistently going back to uh, on the margins of the Munich Security Conference, any um, ste steps being taken um, by China uh, to provide lethal aid uh, uh, to Russia would be uh, deeply problematic and of great uh, concern to the United States. It's something that we're paying uh, very close attention to and uh, will take appropriate action um, as needed should uh, a certain line be crossed. As it relates to the joint statement, though, Nike, uh, on Ukraine, the two sides said that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter must be observed and international law must be respected. Well, following the UN Charter would mean that Russia withdrawing from the territory of another UN member state uh, it has invaded. The UN Charter enshrines the principles of respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, including Ukraine. And if China wants to play a constructive role in this conflict, then it should press Russia to remove its forces from Ukraine's sovereign territory. As uh, I have said at a number of in the various intervals, uh, this war could end today if Russia were to choose to withdraw its forces from Ukraine. On a related uh, subject, uh, on Japanese Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Kiev, um, and as we see the from the news, uh, President Zelensky said that he will attend the G7 summit later. Uh, do you have anything on the timing and the implication of uh, Kishida's visit to Ukraine? Uh, on any of the scheduling um, uh, of the G7, that's um, uh, uh, I would refer you to uh, uh, our, our Japanese partners. Uh, obviously, they are uh, the uh, G7. They have the G7 presidency this year, so I, I will let them speak to and announce any any schedule. But uh, broadly speaking, we strongly support uh, Prime Minister Kishida's decision to make this historic visit to Ukraine in support of the. Ukrainian people and in support of the UN Charter and the uh, the, the universal values that it that it enshrines. Michelle, yeah, you have I your hand have up. a couple of, yeah. uh, of questions, please. Uh, first, do you have any comments on the warm reception for the Syrian uh, president in the UAE? Well, Michelle, uh, we have uh, remained focused on helping the Syrian people who continue to suffer through more than 12 years of wars and atrocities at the hands of Assad and now a devastating earthquake, uh, our stance against normalization remains unchanged. We will not normalize with the Assad regime, nor will we encourage others absent uh, authentic and enduring progress towards a political resolution in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. We have been clear about this and we've been quite clear about this with our partners as well. Did you ask formally or directly your partners and uh, allies not to normalize with the regime? I'm just not going to get into the specifics of our diplomatic engagements, Michelle, but we continue to ur urge anybody uh, engaging with Damascus to consider sincerely and thoroughly how their engagements can help provide for Syrians in need, no matter where they live. Uh, UAE president has said that it's time for Syria to return to Arab fold. Do you support Syria's return to the Arab League? Uh, again, uh, I, I, I think I was quite clear. We will not normalize with the Assad regime, nor will we encourage others absent authentic and enduring progress uh, for them to uh, normalize their relations with Syria either. And my final question on this. Uh, on, on Syria, I just want to know, is it still the administration's part of the U.S. position that Assad's days are numbered? That Assad what? 
his days are numbered? Uh, I'm not here to uh, announce or make new policy, well, I Matt. I just got wondering. I mean, it was about a decade or a little over a decade ago that the, the former president of the United States said, or a former president of the United States said his days were numbered, something that was repeated all, over and over and over again. And here we are now, 10 years later or even more. Yeah. And um, he's still there, and um, he's visiting one of your good friends. Uh, again, Matt, I don't have a new uh, U.S. policy to announce uh, beyond what I said are, uh, that, you know, our hope is for an authentic and enduring progress toward a political solution that is in line with the will of the Syrian people. And Back my, to fin you, my final question yeah. on this, uh, are you considering uh, uh, to apply the Caesar Act uh, against the countries who uh, normalize with the Syrian regime? Uh, uh, Michelle, I'm not uh, going to uh, preview or get ahead of any actions. I think what I will just say again and reiterate is that uh, uh, we remain committed to assisting the Syrian people by working with international partners to deliver life-saving assistance, uh, but broadly as it relates to normalization, we uh, will not normalize with the Assad regime, nor will we encourage others absent authentic and enduring progress as well. Go ahead in the back. Uh, thank you, Vidal. Uh, Jack Smirchin with the Epic Times. Great. Uh, John Kirby stated yesterday that Secretary Yellen, Secretary Raimondo may potentially visit China. Do you have any information regarding the objectives of this visit? Uh, I will let uh, uh, the Secretaries of Commerce and uh, Treasury speak uh, to their own travel, um, specifically as it relates to Secretary Blinken, though. Uh, as he has said quite openly before, uh, uh, we will reschedule our uh, visit to the PRC when uh, conditions allow. I don't have any updates on uh, when uh, or what that could look like, but it's a, a line of effort we're continuing to pursue. Um, and does the department have any reaction to um Putin and Xi's pledge to deepen their strategic relations today? Well, I think I just uh, answered a number of questions about uh, uh, President Putin and President Xi's meetings. Okay, and then one final one on, Pol on Ukraine. Um, Poland and Slovakia pledged fighter jets for Ukraine. Does this change the U.S. position on providing jets for the war? What are the factors preventing the U.S. from providing the jets? It, it, it does not change our, our position, and uh, the Secretary had an opportunity to, to speak to this a little bit um, in uh, Niamey uh, during his press conference, but uh, the transfer of military equipment is a sovereign decision for a country to make in a manner consistent with its international obligations. Uh, Poland and Slovakia have both been providing a significant amount of security assistance to Ukraine, as have more than 50 nations around the world alongside of the United States. You've uh, heard the president and leaders of the Pentagon uh, be quite clear. F-16s are not something we are considering right now. We have been focused on sending Ukraine what they need to succeed in each phase of this war, uh, as we have consistently done so uh, since even before uh, uh, February of last year. Uh, right now, uh, it, our focus is on air defense capabilities and weapons and equipment they need to retake the ground. Go ahead. Yeah. Indian Prime Minister met in New Delhi mm -hmm. and uh, agreed to maintain the rule-based international order. So are you welcoming this meeting as a partner of Pacific port? And, and one more mm -hmm. is uh, uh, Japanese Foreign Minister Hayashi has been criticized by some media outlet when he was absent in the G20 Foreign Minister's meeting um, because of a domestic cabinet session. Sure. Do you have any comment? Let, let, let me say a, a couple of things on your second question. Um, uh, I will let uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi and his team speak to his own schedule, but what I can say is that Secretary Blinken um, enjoyed uh, uh, being with uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi the very next day, uh, uh, in which they were able to sit together on a, a panel for the Quad during the Ricina dialogue. They also had the opportunity to have a uh, great uh, bilateral engagement on the margins of the Ricina dialogue as well, uh, and we continue to view Japan as an important and critical partner uh, when it comes to uh, not just uh, only our priorities in the Indo-Pacific, but in the in the world broadly. Uh, and to your first question, I will um, let, of course, New Delhi and, and Tokyo speak uh, to their own um, uh, engagements. But uh, of course, you know, members of the uh, of the Quad uh, engaging in their own um, bilateral uh, engagements is a, is a good and welcome thing. But I will let them let them speak to that. Go ahead, and I'll come back to you. Sorry, go ahead. The Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador criticized earlier today the, your human rights report, and he called the State Department a, a liar. 
Uh, do you have any any comment on that? Well, uh, what I would say is that the United States has worked for decades to strengthen uh, and res uh, respect for human rights, and this commitment reflects core American values and internationally recognized human rights enshrined in documents such as the uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, this is a report that we have released uh, regularly on an annual basis, and uh, it is about uh, recognizing and promoting uh, the human rights and the foundations of freedom and justice and worldwide peace. Umara. It was pretty much the same question, but I mean, do you actually have a response to him calling you guys liars? And um, they also say U.S. believes it's the government of the world. Those are like pretty strong words. Do you, do you have a response to that? We have never uh, uh, been uh, ones to indicate that uh, we are the governments of the world or, or some kind of uh, edict like that. Um, specifically as it uh, relates to Mexico though, the uh, reported involvement of members of Mexican police, military, and other government institutions in serious acts of corruption and unlawful arbitrary killings remain a serious challenge for Mexico and that's why they were highlighted in our report. Uh, but also broadly as it relates to the United States, uh, uh, we have never been one to uh, try and imply we don't have our own challenges uh, domestically. The secretary has spoken uh, to this uh, quite candidly before. And as has, he likes to say, um, we do not uh, sweep these issues under the rug. Uh, we talk about them openly. We engage on these issues. Um, and the Human Rights Report, another thing important to remember is that it is uh, something that's mandated uh, by Congress. Uh, we, of course, um, don't uh, critique and uh, uh, look at ourselves through the auspices of this report specifically, but we do do that broadly and we do that in other uh, multilateral settings and we take part in um, forums as it relates to human rights in the United States as well. Nick, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, Team Cuba cat catcher defecting to the United States after his team was eliminated in the World Baseball Classic. Are you familiar with that story? Do you have any comment on it? Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with that, Nick. I'm going to have to check on that and, and, and get back to you. I haven't seen that reporting. Uh, go ahead in the back, Mikhail. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, are you satisfied with the results of the negotiations between Turkey, Finland, and Sweden? Uh, the reason I'm asking you is because you said uh, many times from the podium that you wanted both countries uh, to join NATO. Well, uh, Mikhail, as we said last week, we welcome President Erdogan's announcement that he will send Finland's uh, NATO accession protocols to the Turkish parliament. And we look forward to uh, the prompt, positive conclusion of that process. We also encourage Turkey to quickly ratify Sweden's accession protocols as well. Uh, our belief continues to be, uh, as robustly uh, when this process started, that Sweden and Finland are both strong, capable partners that share NATO's values and will strengthen the alliance and contribute to European security. The U.S. believes that both countries should become uh, members of NATO as soon as possible. So you are not, uh, you are not agree with, uh, with the actions by Mr. Erdogan, uh, who is stopping the Sweden to join the NATO. As we, I understand. Remain, we remain fully committed to feed it, Finland and Sweden's accession. Uh, the strength of that support uh, can be clear in our own Senate, overwhelming bipartisan vote, as well as the swiftness of uh, President Biden citing those pro protocols, as well as uh, the, the Department of State accepting them as well. This is something that we are uh, deeply, deeply committed to. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I'd like to follow up on Japanese Prime Minister visit to Ukraine, which started just after Chinese leader Xi Jinping's meeting with Putin in Russia. During Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Ukraine, what kind of message and support does the U.S. hope Japan to offer? Also, did the U.S. offer any help for Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Ukraine to be safe? 
Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, of, of, of any engagements like that, but what I will say broadly and reiterate again is that we strongly support uh, Prime Minister Kishida's decision to make this historic visit to Ukraine. Uh, Japan has been an incredible partner in uh, holding the Russian Federation accountable in supporting our Ukrainian partners. Uh, they have done so uh, since this conflict started, uh, and I know that they will continue to do so, especially um, this year uh, as, a, as they are going to take uh, the president of the G7, and the G7 body uh, as a whole has also played uh, an incredible role in not just supporting our Ukrainian partners, but uh, holding the, the Russian Federation accountable. Elizabeth? Uh, go back to Saudi Arabia. Sure. Are there currently any cases of wrongfully detained U.S. nationals in the kingdom? Uh, it is not my understanding uh, that, that, that there are, that there are any wrongfully uh, detained uh, cases in the kingdom right now. And then can you provide any update on the handful of Americans that are under travel ban in the kingdom, has the administration made any progress in seeking their release? So broadly speaking, uh, we have no higher priority than the well-being and fair treatment of all U.S. nationals detained overseas. Our consular officers overseas seek to ensure that U.S. Uh, nationals who are detained are receiving humane treatment and that all fair trial uh, guarantees are respected. Uh, and as we would with any country, we continue to push for uh, regular and consistent consular access, but I don't have any uh, specifics on specific cases to well, offer. Can you speak to the broad issue of the travel bans themselves? It, are, do, you, do you think they're okay if that's the law of the country, or do you think that uh, a foreign country should should not be allowed to ban an American citizen, even if they are a dual national, from leaving that country? Uh, Matt, uh, of course, each country is going to have its own um, sovereign laws, and each case is uh, is different. So I'm not going to speak about this in a, so you don't in a broad any, brush stroke. You, you, you don't have any. There's nothing in, the, in your guidance about the travel ban issue in Saudi Arabia specifically, even if it doesn't discuss. What I would say cases. is that the welfare and safety of U.S. citizens yeah, overseas is the highest priority, time, uh, and this we continue for for American citizens who are placed under. Um, uh, who, are, who are detained or are placed under travel bans. We continue to engage uh, directly with them through our consular officers to try and find uh, uh, ways to rectify those circumstances if we can uh, and ensure that U.S. detained nationals are receiving humane treatment and that all uh, relevant fair trial guarantees are respected. Uh, final question, we'll go to Alex and Nike. Thanks so much, we'll uh, on, uh, Armea Azerbaijan. Sure. I was hoping, hoping you would help us fair understand the first line in your readouts of uh, the Secretary's call to both Yerevan and Baku. You said he called them to offer continued U.S. assistance in facilitating peace discussions. I was, I, I thought that's what you guys were doing. You had last week senior advisor in the region was engaging with the sites. Why would the Secretary make that call to ask for Yes, you know, he was yes, he yes. was offering his continued support on the U.S.'s uh, assistance in these uh, in these engagements, which, uh, as you know, Alex, you've watched this issue quite closely, uh, has something that we have remained um, quite committed on. Obviously, through uh, Secretary Blinken's commitment to this issue, um, when Ambassador Reeker was uh, was was uh, leading this portfolio through his work, and now through the through the work of Lubano as well. And there's one line I did not see this time on uh, the call to Azerbaijan, which was about human rights. Yesterday, we were just discussed in this room, you guys mentioned that you are raising all those cases. Did the Secretary raise human rights issues? Uh, I don't have specifics to get into about the diplomatic engagements, Alex, beyond what was in the readout. But of course, human rights is something that we raise uh, regularly uh, with, uh, with, with all our uh, partners, including those in, in the South Caucasus. Would, would you be you. surprised if you didn't? Uh, Alex, uh, again, I'm just not going to get into uh, specific diplomatic engagements. Nike, and then we'll yeah, wrap. Um, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen will stop over New York and California before heading to Central America. Do you have anything on that? Um, given the they are presidents and all democratically elected Taiwan presidents have transit through the United States during their terms, uh, should it be a pretext for any military escalation in the Taiwan Strait. And do you know if anyone from this building plan to meet or to talk to her physically or virtually? Thank you. Let me say a couple things, Nike. This transit is consistent, as you so said, with longstanding U.S. practice. The unofficial uh, nature of our relations with Taiwan and U.S. policy, uh, which remains unchanged. 
Transits are taken out of consideration for safety and comfort and convenience and dignity of the passenger and are in consistent with our One China policy, which also remains unchanged. Uh, transits are private and official and unofficial, and every Taiwan president has transited the United States. President Tsai has transited the United States six times since taking office in 2016, and high-level officials uh, have typically wet with uh, members of Congress, which is a separate and co-equal branch of government, and engage in other public and private activities during those transits. Anyone from the building going to meet with him? Again, this transit is uh, private and unofficial, so uh, as of right now, I'm not aware of any plans for any meetings with the department. Yeah, yeah, be done. Could I ask you about the convenience part of this? Sure. Right? Transits are bit done or approved based on the safe for the safety, comfort, convenience, and dignity of the passenger. How exactly is it convenient to fly from Taipei to Guatemala through New York? Uh, Matt, I'm not going to uh, uh, try and uh, pretend that I understand uh, flight patterns or anything like that. I looked up the flight times. It is uh, about a 15-hour flight from Taipei to New York City. It is only an 11-hour flight from Taipei to Los Angeles. Um, so, in other words, it is not particularly convenient for her to fly through New York to get to Guatemala and Belize. Uh, again, Matt, this transit is consistent uh, with long-standing U.S. practice, and they are indeed taken out of consideration for the safety, comfort, and convenience, and dignity of the passenger as well. Yeah, Final I, question, Saeed. Yeah, I, I want to ask about Iraq, if nobody has. Sure, go yeah. ahead. I, I mean, yesterday marked the 20th anniversary since the invasion and occupation of Iraq by U.S. forces. And I wonder if this administration of this Department of State reassesses, you know, this whole, you know, this whole episode and uh, or this, this whole tragedy, let's say, you know, that close to uh, 4,600 American troops died, uh, maybe upward of 300,000 Iraqis. I know I worked at the UN. We counted uh, in Iraq those figures and so on. The country is still broken. You know, it is dysfunctional. There is more uh, influenced by Iran than uh, any other time. I wonder if you guys uh, sort of take a pause and take a look at this whole thing and how do you assess it? Said, uh, th our administration, our attention uh, is, uh, as it relates to our relationship with Iraq, uh, is forward-looking. Uh, currently, uh, Said, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, 50% of Iraq's population is 20 years old. And so much of our work is concentrated on them and looking forward. Our attention is on expanding uh, the U.S.-Iraq strategic framework agreement uh, beyond security to a 360 degree relationship that delivers results for the Iraqi people. Uh, we have been through uh, much in the past 20 years. Conflict and rebuilding, the fight to defeat ISIS and terrorism, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, global financial crisis, climate change challenges, water scarcity. Uh, 20 years in, the U.S. and Iraq continue to build on our strategic partnership. This means we are growing areas of cooperation to include all facets of our bilateral relationship. Um, Secretary Blinken had the opportunity to meet with Prime Minister Sudani on the margins of the Munich Security Conference, and we agree on the need to ensure an enduring defeat to ISIS, establish Iraq's energy independence, support the growth of the private sector, improve public services, in addition, expand educational and cultural programming. Our ultimate goal is to strengthen Iraqi stability, security, and sovereignty. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.